guys, welcome to Price List B Movies. I'm your host, Colin Price, and I'm here today with another list for you. And, uh, you know, it, it was dawning on me the other day, I was actually watching Sinister, um, came on 2012, and I've seen the movie a few times, but it dawned on me um, how great the ending of that was. And, you know, I love movies, especially horror and thriller films that have great twist endings. You know, whether we're talking about uh, The Usual Suspects or Psycho or Seven or you know, any, any movie where the twist ending, The Sixth Sense, where you watch the ending and then it immediately makes you want to go and watch the movie again and figure out how that makes sense and how they were able to fool you into thinking that it would end some other way. A twist ending can be phenomenal if done right. Unfortunately though, more often than not, they're not done right. So this is my pick for the top 10 worst twist endings in horror. Number 10, Case 39. Case 39 is one of two films on this list that I've actually reviewed before. So after you're watching this list, you can kind of go back in my review history and check those videos out if you want to. Case 39 stars Renee Zellweger as a social worker, and uh, she stumbles across this little girl and uh, believes that this little girl's parents are going to try to kill her. And sure enough, about 20 minutes into the movie, she catches the parents doing just that. She's able to rescue the child, and then decides out of the goodness of her heart that she's become so attached to this little girl that she wants to be the one to raise her, so she brings the girl into her home. And it doesn't take too long before she realizes that this little girl's got quite a few dark secrets herself. I guess I should put a spoiler alert out there, but honestly, since we're talking about horror movies and twist endings, I figured that was just a given. But anyway, spoiler alert, this little girl turns out to actually be a form of demon that preys on people's fears and drives them to murder or suicide, drives them to horribly violent crimes. And that's why her parents were trying to kill her at the beginning, because they're, they were actually doing the right thing. They were trying to get rid of this evil force disguised as this little girl. It's a really neat setup for a horror film, and there are a lot of things I like about it, except the ending. This little girl is brought up to be, or built up to be, rather, this horrifically evil being. And uh, Jodelle Ferlin as the little girl, she, she, great performance from the actress, that no fault on her at all. But the movie ends with Renee Zellweger uh, and the girl in the back of her car driving the car into a river. And they have this little wrestling match underwater in the car. And then the girl basically just turns into this thing that kind of looks like the little creatures from Galaxy Quest. And then <laughs> she locks the little girl in the car, gets out of the car herself, swims to safety, and that's it. Basically, she just drowned the demon in a car. If it was that easy to kill a demon, then you gotta wonder how no one else, in including the little girl's parents, why, why no one was capable of doing that earlier. If it was that simple, I mean, come on, you just put her in a car, drive her own into a river. You'd think a demon would be harder to kill, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, The Strangers. The Strangers stars Scott Speedman and Liv Tyler as a couple who are in their uh, somewhat isolated vacation home and they are set upon by a trio of masked murderers. Um, the Strangers is one of those films that is actually fairly popular. A lot of people really like this movie. I can't stand this movie. So here's my problem with movies like this, and there's a few of them. Um, if you've ever heard of the director Ty West, he's notorious for doing this crap, where he'll take what would have normally been a five minute scene in a movie. You know, and then he'll stretch it to 90 minutes to two hours. I'm bored out of my freaking skull waiting for something to happen. Now, I have nothing against slow burn movies at all if they're done right. But here's how you do a slow burn. You gradually build tension over the course of a number of events leading to a great reveal at the end. What Ty West, and he didn't direct this film, but what Ty West and the director of The Strangers have in common is they decided, let's take the five to ten minute, uh, here's the killer stalking the person through the house death scene, and let's make it a full film. Yeah. The film spends so much time building toward the idea of hope, that these, that these two are somehow going to make it out of here alive. And when you get to the end, the killers trap them, tie them to chairs, and kill them. And that's more or less the end of the film. Ugh! 
What's even worse than this, however, is that the last scene of the film shows someone else coming into the house and finding the bodies of Liv Tyler and Scott Speedman, and it's like the next day, like the sun's pouring through, the noon sun is pouring through, right? And then this person comes upon Liv Tyler's corpse, and she suddenly comes alive in shock and grabs it, and that's the end of the film. Okay, you got multiple stab wounds in you, you've been bleeding out for what has to have been seven or eight hours. You're not in shock waking up scaring anyone. You're fucking dead. And you know what's even worse than that? I read somewhere that they're making a Strangers 2. How much you want to bet it's the same damn thing? Actually, you know what? I'm taking bets right now. Who wants to bet that it's the same damn thing? Comment on my video below and let me know. Number 8. Saw 3D. What's really sad about this entry is that the first Saw movie is a film that I would put up with the classics that have twist endings. Like, I would put Saw next to Seven. I would put Saw next to uh, The Sixth Sense in terms of how well the twist ending works. Now, whether or not you think that Saw is as good as those other movies, I'm just saying in the sense that the twist works just as well. The first Saw movie has a fantastic ending that's I'm at least going to forever revere as one of the best on film. That being said, I mean, when you get to parts two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, when everything kind of relies on that twist ending being there because it became part of the formula of those films, unfortunately it means that after a few movies, your films stop making sense, your storylines stop making sense. And never was this more apparent than the ending of Saw 3D where we have uh, Costas Mandalore's character, who since part four or five we've known has been in on everything, has been one of the people helping Jigsaw commit these murders. And uh, parts uh, five and six have been more about um, him trying to prevent that information from being made public, him trying to prevent the, the other police officers from finding that out. Now, once it gets to the end of Saw 3, or Saw 3D, we uh, find out the twist ending is that Carrie Elwes, the doctor from the first movie he cut off his own foot, has also been one of Jigsaw's helpers. Except how the hell does that make any sense? That means that Cosmos Mandler's character and Carrie Elwes' character would have have to directly have worked together a number of times for any of that to flow. So why is Cosmos Mandalore surprised at the revelation at the end of this film? Not only that, but instead of coming up with a new creative twist ending, it really is just Carrie always locks Cosmos Mandalore in the same basement that was used in the twist endings of part one, two, and probably one of the other ones that I'm just forgetting right now. This was a really pathetic ending, and not only was it pathetic because it was repetitive, but it was pathetic because it doesn't really hold any water. It doesn't make any sense. Number seven. Neighbor. Neighbor is the other film on this list that I've reviewed, and if you've seen my review for that, you know that I don't really want to spend too much time talking about this movie. I, quite frankly, I've wasted enough of my life on this film. It's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It's basically about this girl who's just called The Girl. She's not important enough to have a name. And she goes from house to house torturing and killing people, is somehow never caught. But uh, most of the plot revolves around her in this one guy's house, basically torturing him in his basement. And uh, what's really weird is that this guy was having a party. So there were a lot of people just right upstairs who somehow never heard screams, never heard you know, the whole time that she's, you know, uh, drilling his toes open and, you know, cutting his kneecaps off and all kinds of gross, disturbing stuff that she does to this guy. Somehow the whole time, not a single person upstairs was aware of it. I think at one point someone's aware of it and they go downstairs and then she tortures them too. I can't even remember. I've seen the movie once and I really don't want to see it again. But another thing that really pisses me off about this movie is the ending where she just gets up, walks out of the basement after the other people are dead, walks right through the party guests. First of all, how does no one go, hey... Who's that? How does he know her? Who's she? She's covered in blood. She's walking out the door. No one stops her or anything. But she leaves the building and just walks down the street, presumably off to just go kill someone else. And that's the end of the film. So basically, this has been 80 to 90 minutes of torture porn. Straight torture porn. There's no story to go with it. It is just, she goes in this house, tortures this guy, and leaves. And that's the movie. That's the whole movie. Mind blown. Number six, 
the game. Man, you know, it really bums me out. I'm a big fan of David Fincher. I didn't care so much for The Social Network, but I most of the time I'm a big fan of David Fincher. You know, I didn't even think that Alien 3 was that bad. I think that, you know, if you're able to watch his vision of it, or at least understand his vision of it, it's pretty damn good. Seven was pretty damn good. I really liked his interpretation of the girl with the dragon tattoo. Most of the things that David Fincher does, I tend to like. The game, not so much. The game stars Michael Douglas as a businessman who's kind of ne'er-do-well brother, Sean Penn, uh, puts him through this uh, game. And this, what's weird is that the, the game's supposed to be like a birthday gift to Michael Douglas. So you'd think it'd be something pleasant. No, what this game does, it basically puts him in this weird uh, scenario where he's constantly in danger, constantly in peril. People are dying all around him. It seems like it's this big conspiracy. And then at the end of the movie... Michael Douglas goes crazy because he ends up thinking that he's shot his brother, that he's shot Sean Penn, and completely distressed, he jumps off this building in a suicide attempt. Then we get to the twist of the story, because that's not the twist of the story. Then we get to the twist of the story, where after having fallen off this building, I'm going to have a really hard time getting through this one. He gets up, and everyone who's been involved goes, You've won the game! Yeah, it was, it was like a practical joke. Okay, so at this point, Michael Douglas has been beaten, mugged, shot at. You know, all these horrible things. He's, he's been made to believe that he's killed his brother, right? That he has killed his brother. This movie, this game, drove him to a legitimate suicide attempt. But... Once he finds out that it's all over, it's all a joke, yada yada, what does he do? He laughs. He's like, oh, that was a good one. He gives his brother a hug. Oh, that was good. Fuck you, I'd be killing everyone in that room. That is the dumbest fu- Mmm. Number five. The Village. Man, M. Night Shyamalan has made some stinkers in the past, huh? I mean, between this one... Uh, signs, The Happening, oh my god. You know, the guy had like one good movie, The Sixth Sense, with one good twist ending, and then he decided that every little idea that popped into his head was going to make a good ending for a film. And that's how we got crap like this, The Village. Now, The Village, for those of you who don't know, and I'm pr fairly certain that everyone watching this video knows what The Village is, it's the film where uh, we're led to believe that this colonial village um, these people live in this village and that there's monsters in the woods surrounding the village and the, so everyone's kind of afraid to leave and venture out. By the end of the film, one of the characters, a blind girl no less, goes out, ventures out into the woods and then the big twist at the end is when she gets through the woods, she stumbles upon a highway. So the twist is that we're not a couple hundred years ago, we're in present day. And the elders who run this village have held this masquerade, and they've been pretending to be these monsters, like dressing up in monster costumes and scaring people into not leaving the village. Now, this is actually an idea where, like, if the twist ending was just that, the monsters weren't real, it was the elders, and they didn't want anyone to escape. That would be a legitimate twist ending to the story. That actually seems more like the legitimate ending that this film is naturally building to. But then to try to add that the timeline is all wrong, too, that it actually takes place in modern day, now we've got all kinds of logistic problems. Like, for one thing, how come, like, no one ever saw an airplane or something fly over? I had someone try to tell me, well, you know, the chief elder bribed the U.S. government to, you know, to not fly planes over and to not yada yada. Bullshit! You tell me some kind of reality where that would actually happen. You really think that the U.S. government would just hand over supreme power to the whims of some psychopath? Actually, actually, you know what? Never mind. I withdraw that statement because Trump is president after all. Number four. The Forgotten. The Forgotten stars Julianne Moore, and uh, near the beginning of the film, she loses her nine-year-old son because she's too busy ripping off and ruining great Jodie Foster characters. I'm just kidding, that's not really what happens. But anyway, she loses her nine-year-old son, and the movie is basically about uh, her efforts to try to figure out what happened to him, because once she starts going around to people and saying, hey, my son's gone, everyone's kind of like, you had a son? And it's weird, like, 
no one is really acknowledging that this child even existed. And it becomes this great mystery as she's trying to figure out not only what happened to her kid, but why everyone seems to have forgotten that she ever had one. Now, I remember back in 2004, 2005, it was somewhere around that point that this movie came out, and I remember seeing the first trailers for this and thinking, wow, what a great setup, what a great mystery, because there's so many questions to be answered. Like, this has to be a really elaborate and complex thriller, right? And then we get to the end of the film and realize that the solution, what, what, what happened to her son? Aliens. That's right. Aliens took her son and wiped the memories of everyone so that they would forget that the son existed. That's the ending. Aliens. And even at the end of the film, upon her discovering the, that one of the other characters is one of the aliens, and once he's found out, he's just inexplicably kind of sucked up into the sky, I guess that he realized that the planet was just as full of hot air as the script was. But it's just amazing that you have such a great idea for a film, such a great thought, and you boil it down to, aliens did it. What a kick in the nuts to people who, like me who actually thought this was going to be a really interesting thriller. No, it's just aliens. Number three, Wolf Creek. Wolf Creek is a thriller from 2005. Uh, that has three kids backpacking through Australia. I just realized, what is it with this rule of three? Isn't it always like three people? Blair Witch, three people. Wolf Creek, three people. Hostel 1 and 2, three people. And what is it with these thrillers when people get lost somewhere? It's always got to be three of them. That's another interesting thing. If you can figure that one out, or if you can even think of more movies that do that, comment below and let me know. But anyway, uh, Wolf Creek has three people uh, backpacking through Australia, and they come across this kind of weird foul mouth crocodile Dundee kind of guy who uh, then abducts them and takes them back to his home where he proceeds to torture and kill them. That's the horror element of the film. Now, the problem with the ending comes in when, by the end of the film, two of the three kids are dead, one of them is mortally wounded, like, I believe he's crucified, and then pulls himself off the wall and stumbles into the desert, bleeding out. Probably not going to live more than another 20, 30 minutes, right? But then it tries to say, based on a true story. My question is, who is alive to tell the story? The killer? Because he sure as hell didn't just turn himself in. So what's going on with this? How can this be based on a true story when no one is left alive to tell the story to anybody? I guess I'm okay with movies like uh, Sin City, you know, or, or, or um, you know, movies where the narrator doesn't survive the film, and so it's just kind of the novelty that they were narrating the film even though they were technically already dead. I, if done right, I don't have a problem with that kind of movie, but I do have a problem with a movie that says based on a true story, but then no one survives the story. Like, How does that work? Who was alive to tell the story? Number two, The Blair Witch Project. Man, I seem to be talking about this ending a lot recently. The Blair Witch is infamous, man. I just I reviewed a couple months ago the new movie, Blair Witch, and uh, then um, in a video I did recently, uh, top ten movies that I get flack for not liking, I mentioned The Blair Witch, I think even at number two, maybe number three, as a movie that I don't particularly like, but that uh, I tend to take some shit from certain people because I don't like it. The main reason I don't like it is the ending. This movie is minus an ending, so the, the three, uh, once again, the three, get lost in the woods, and then they find, they stumble upon this house, and, you know, it's all part of the local legend, so that's supposed to make it scary, even though it's really not. And then the one finds, the girl finds the guy standing in the corner, and she, which is also part of the legend, and she freaks out, and the camera drops, and that's the end of the movie. And I'm just kind of like... Anything could have happened, but a better ending than nothing would have been something. Something. I don't even care if it ended with right before the camera dropped, some Grimm's fairy tale witch or hag jumped right out in the camera for just a split second and then the camera dropped. Now that would have been terrifying. But the fact that there's no basis given to let us know what even happened... Once again, I remember sitting in the theater when that movie came out and being like, she tripped on a squirrel. Because that's just as legitimate an excuse for the ending of this film. It drives me crazy that people give this movie so much respect. It's one of the dumbest movies I've ever seen, and it's a total con job. But, oh well, my opinion, and I know it's not one that's shared by everybody. Number one, 
high tension. Well, here we are. It's taken us a little bit to get here because I like to drone on and on and on, but we're here at the most indefensible of indefensible endings. This is a movie about a, a young blonde lesbian who is uh, with her friend who she's crushing on, and the two of them are staying at her friend's family's house out in the middle of the country, and uh, this huge, like, 250-pound muscle-bound trucker breaks into the house, kills just about everyone except for the lesbian and her friend, kidnaps the friend, and so the lesbian gets out and chases him down, and the movie is basically, now she's going to try to stop this guy from killing her friend, too. The twist comes at the end after this little blonde girl has brutally beaten this trucker to death, which is... But in and of itself a stretch that she could take on a guy of his size. But she brutally beats him to death, and she goes and she goes to unlock the car and save her friend, and her friend starts freaking out, like, no, get away from me! And then that's the big reveal. The trucker, get this, pulled a Tyler Durden. The trucker never existed. And the whole time, it was the blonde girl, who we've all been led to believe is the hero of the story, who killed the girl's family and kidnapped her. And, oh my god, this is stupid. I mean, among other things, how do you explain that there's two vehicles involved if one of the people driving, if the guy driving the truck doesn't exist, then how do you explain that the truck is there and the blonde girl is driving the car? How is she driving two vehicles? That, but there's not only that, there's a number of things. Like, uh, we see this guy pulling off murders and doing things that only someone with a certain, you know, amount, degree of muscle and force could do. We're to believe this girl that I could beat up did all this stuff? Come on, I mean, look at this. I am not a strong man, but I could have taken this little blonde girl. But you're really going to lead me to believe that she killed a guy with a bookcase and did... <laughs> No, no. This is like the dumbest twist ending of all time. And that's kind of saying a lot, considering some of the other movies on this list. Well, those are my picks for the top 10 worst twist endings in horror. Uh, please stay tuned. i got a lot more reviews coming. I know I haven't really been posting reviews as regularly, and I, I mean to get back to that, especially with the Stephen King ones leading up to uh, It coming out in September. I'm definitely going to have a few more of those and a couple other reviews that I mean to post soon. I've been fairly busy. Um, I actually am getting married in two days, so that's kind of taking up a lot of my time planning for that and a couple other things. So, uh, you know, stay patient with me. I will get back to posting a little more regularly here soon. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more Priceless B movies.